I'm sure a lot of you guys are like me and you have Pokemon that you like, but you would never consider them in your top five. And for me, Politoed is one of those Pokemon. I think it's goofy in the best way possible. It's got this little cotton candy, randy, shiny sprite. It's one of the best to this day. And it has a beta sprite that was so good that Game Freak knew that they had to change it or it would just be too powerful. Just look at this thing. This is perfection personified. Today, we're gonna be back in Pokemon Crystal to see how this little frog will do in a solo challenge. And if you want the rules or any other information, just check out the description. But just grab yourself a Sodi Pop and we're just gonna get into this one really quick today. Here's what you need to know about Politoed. Since it's a branching evolution of Poliwhirl, it's essentially going to be the special weighted version of Poliwrath without that pesky fighting typing, and I don't really have anything bad to say about the stats. It's not slow, it does have a lot of bulk, and you guys, I think you know how I feel about bulk at this point, don't get me started. Level up moves, they are pretty sparse, but I don't think that's a bad thing. Some Pokemon, they get a lot of bloat, and essentially you're just going to have to waste a lot of time just by ignoring level up moves, but here we got Water Gun, it's a pretty solid starting move and I think hypnosis is pretty great if you're a freak that likes to go outside in your yard and just flip coins for hours each day but that's pretty much it now I'm gonna level with you guys water types they almost all play out the same outside of maybe something like lantern you're gonna get a decently early stab serve you're gonna get ice punch for coverage and you get standard things like return for later but just like polyrath there's some interesting coverage here most notably earthquake and psychic later in the game but those don't really do much for the majority of the game but it is something to think about As for the gameplay, the only thing to touch on really early is that we are going to go against the Chikorita line. Razor Leaf on rival number 2 is a gargantuan challenge if you're weak to it, but there's really nothing else left to say here. We do minimum battles, and I'm going to head directly to the gym, and we don't even have to waste any time in this video. This one's simple. There's gonna be no mud slung in our face today. And I just make this as easy as possible. Politoed gives me a little fist bump. We get a turn one crit and we just take out the Pidgey immediately. And I just cruise overall in this battle. I will say that doing more and more crystal runs, I have a huge respect for berries and I think they're just overall underrated. Gaining 10 effective HP in battles from the hill, I think it's really big. And when you're using a bulky Pokemon, you have those extra defensive stats. It's pretty much the same as having a couple of extra levels and it just makes me personally a lot more confident really pushing things to the limit in the early game but that's the first badge down already Moving ahead, I'm going to just bring up split data just for a second, not the graphic, I'm just going to talk about it. This is the first crystal run in a while, you know I'm working up a tier list here. But my plan in general for all of my content going forward is to talk about the data somewhere around the third badge since all Pokemon are going to follow the same path. And then we'll take a look at it again somewhere around the 8th gym, maybe before the league. And after that, maybe we can take a look at it after the Kanto split. And that's going to be the standard. I think there will be some outliers that depends on the run, but I think those three points should tell us everything that we need to know. Now as we're walking, let me just kind of quickly address the overlay. Some of you might know I've been working on this in the background for a while, but its DNA is pretty much one-to-one -one with a gen one overlay by design. There's some small differences. I kept the positions of things like speed, I replaced crit to account for the special split, and outside of that, I have a friendship shown by this little icon here. It's a little heart guy just hugging himself so you know how friendly it is, but this is important for two different aspects. The first is that it lets me see when I'm at 150 friendship, because that's when you can pick up return and golden rod, and this little box will will disappear in general after 176 friendship and you might be saying why 176 and it's because at that point return is going to be stronger than headbutt so I know to teach return get rid of headbutt now I don't have text for held items either but if you've been around the channel for a while you know that I just show the held items I draw them on the sprite dynamically and it's kind of more of like one of those show and not tell type approach to keep things clean and not messy overall and have too much bloat on the overlay as for the next route I do need just a little extra help a couple of extra battles here. Having water moves makes really quick battles like Hakka Russell and Hakko Ant- Hakko. I'm gonna keep that in. Hakko. Put Hakko real big on the screen right now. But Hakka Russell, Hakka Anthony, they're a perfect targets to quickly take out. And then after the Slowpoke Well segment, I am gonna take on the optional trainer in Bugsy's Gym that has a bee drill. And then we're finally gonna jump into the Bug Top Specialist. 
For this gym, we all know, the first two Pokemon, they don't matter, no one cares, it's Metapod, it's Kakuna, and whoever thought it was a good idea to give Bugsy, Kakuna, and Metapod, their f it's forever gonna be a mystery. Blast them down, let's just get to the, the meaty part of the gym. Getting to level 18 for this fight was kinda just like a side effect of needing to get a higher level later, but that extra levels, they do help in pretty much all aspects. The increased bulk allows me to not rely on hypnosis luck and just kinda survive, and you can see that the berry makes this one pretty comfortable as well. Without it, I would have still survived at just 3 health, but remember damage is a range, so it would be a little too risky for my blood if I didn't use the berry, but that's badge number 2 now, but let's not waste any time, we can just get straight into that second rival fight. Ghastly can be annoying here with status conditions, it's got hypnosis as well, but it's generally not going to be a problem, and this fight is kind of like notoriously difficult, I talked about Razor Leaf earlier, and that's what's kind of fast approaching here, and that's the real problem for the fight. The strat here is just to, to be kind of lame, now I'm not one to overly rely on hypnosis, but I know when you should and shouldn't use it, and this is a use hypnosis type of situation. Now to this point, I haven't talked about double slap, but this move is absolute dog water, but you have to use it here. Now it's pretty much just your standard bad Pokemon move, it has subpar accuracy, it has low base damage, but the cherry on top is that it's one of those weird moves that Game Freak only gave like 10 PP to, and I just wish, for once in my life, I just wish I knew who thought Double Slap would be too powerful if it had like 25 PP. Game balance in the early days of Pokemon is, is weird, I'm not saying it's, it would be an easy job, but some things are funny. Things like Vine Whip and Double Slap, they only get 10 PP, but then they go ahead and make moves like Curse that every single Pokemon can learn and can just trivialize the hardest battle in the game, and I'm not hating here, I love it. Don't get me started on that tangent, but being lame here, it got me a pretty clean victory. We make it past the Razor Leaf, let's keep going. In Alex Forest, we're going to be picking up Headbutt, and that's pretty much the only thing that's going to happen here, but I am trying to kind of spread out some of my talking points so I don't overload everybody in the first five minutes of the video, and I want to talk about trade evolutions. To articulate myself the best that I can and not have this turn into just a straight up rant, we don't have like another hidden power scissor type situation here, I'm not a fan of trade evolutions. I can't speak for everybody, I can only speak for myself, but it just kind of locks you out of playing so many cool Pokemon when you're just playing as a kid, and by the time I end ended up trading for most Pokemon, whether it be Gen 1 or Gen 2 that requires specific items. It was after the majority of the game was over or after I had already beaten the game. Now one thing I love about making this type of content is that it allows me to fully experience to see how some of these Pokemon would do from the start that wouldn't be accessible to me any other time, like Gengar, Alakazam, Scizor, or even Politoed here. And I just think that's really cool. I want to know how you guys feel specifically about trade evolutions, and more importantly, I would like to know if you're in the same boat as I was when I was a kid, where you just had to wait forever to use these kind of Pokemon. Now, if you were like a rich kid with two copies of the game and two Game Boys and just traded yourself over a Haunter within the first couple of gems, I still want to hear from you. But making this video, it really makes me think about those sort of things, so I wanted to toss it out there, see how you guys feel. In Goldenrod, we got the typical errands, no need to go over them, but I am going to be back on that path of extra battles. In the Scissor video, I highlighted that you could skip spinners now, I kind of went over how to do it and what I ended up doing, we don't need to go over that again, but I am going to just battle most of them today. Outside of Bug Catcher Arnie at the end, they're all weak to water, so they're pretty quick, they keep me on pace, and as I'm heading to the gym, let me just say that this is the kind of, this is the optimal spot where you would just love to go ahead and pick up Return, especially since Ice Punch is in there as well, but when you start to slim down crystal runs and just cut out battles, it's really rare to have 150 friendship here, so I'm kind of holding off on it for now. Remember, friendship is right there, huggy heart guy, it'll let you know when I'm at 150. Inside the gym, I'm doing two battles total. There's one mandatory fight and there's an optional fight, and that's going to get me up to level 23, but this was mainly a safety strat just to ensure that I hit 150 friendship after the battle. Here I'm at 149, and I'll easily get 150, but we'll talk about that in just a minute. Let's just kind of dive into the gym. After discovering the Fury Cutter strat with Scizor, this is where I would love to have it for Politoed. This would allow you to do Whitney much earlier, and I do think we could do Whitney at an earlier level because of Hypnosis. But either way, I do gun down the Clefairy, and now it's time for that big beefer. 
And we're gonna see, I kinda played a little contradictory to how I prepared for the fight. I don't outspeed anyway, and rather than just kinda duke it out and use that extra levels just to make it through this fight, I actually go for hypnosis. So I could've done this fight earlier. It does connect. My sleep luck, it's been pretty great so far in the video, but Mil Tank doesn't stay asleep for long. But that turn or two difference of extra damage, it puts me too far ahead in the fight, and there's just, there's not enough milk in the world to stop the three toad toad from picking up that third badge. Now, in hindsight, maybe I should've cut out a couple of battles here, but like I said, I wanted to ensure that I could grab her turn and pick up Ice Punch right here after the fight. Let's go back to earlier when I said safety strat. I was talking about in the case of if you got like a bad haircut, and I don't think people talk about the underground haircut enough. Now, to keep it really quick, there are two brothers, and the haircut's gonna give you varying amounts of friendship, and the range can be anywhere from plus one to plus five, and there's a small chance to get plus 10 if you have the right brother. Now, the way I routed things today was just to guarantee that even if I got a plus one, I would still be at 150 friendship no matter what. Normally, I wouldn't bother too much with this since I can just kind of hold off and backtrack later, but I need to visit the Mart right now because of Ice Punch. Grabbing both just saves time, it feels efficient, and Ice Punch is pretty important, especially when we want to trivialize the rival later. And also, since we do have the third gem, it's time for some split data, and for now, it, I'm always just going to compare runs against the fastest time, I guess. So I have the scissor column. It represents scissors time. Pretty self-explanatory. But let's kind of look and see what we got going on here. And you can see that it's really close. There was a four second difference early, and then Politoed pulls ahead in the Bugsy split because Scissor had to do extra training. But after that, Politoed had to do extra training. So by the time we get done with Whitney here, it's back down to seven seconds. And it's really close. And I'm really hoping that this one continues to be close. But say goodbye to split data for now. We'll return to this in a little bit. The last thing before I dive into some more major battles is that this is the spot in the game. We're headed to Ecritig right now. This is where you battle all the Kimono girls, and this is what makes Water Top so powerful in Gen 2. The power spike that comes from getting Ice Punch and then getting Surf while getting close to where Return is going to outpace Headbutt, it's all right after the third gym, and it's something that most tops just can't match with. In my opinion, the only things that can get close is maybe normal tops when Return starts to scale up, or maybe just legendaries with really high stats and wide move pools. But Water Tops are really strong. So now the plan from here is to do the optimal path. And if you remember, Scizor could not do this. It needed to head over to the Lake of Rage, get hidden power, then backtrack to bridge this part of the game to keep the time smooth. So this is a small advantage that Politoed has, but let's get through some battles real quick. I've said this a couple of times in other videos, but for the majority of runs, rival number two is where he's gonna be at his absolute peak strongest, and it's always, basically always downhill from there. With Surf here, we can just murder the first two Pokemon, and what was the kind of original problem in the run with Razor Leaf is now just kind of trivialized with Ice Punch. This one's pretty free, not really much more to say about it. Hopping directly into Morty, there's also not a lot going on here. Surf is just really strong, guys. It gives me one shots on everything but the Gengar, and even that's a guaranteed two shot. Basically here, the only way you could lose is if you got put to sleep with Hypnosis, you stayed asleep for a long time and you just got nuked down. But I really wasn't worried about it too much, and Politoed here gets a quick end to one of the more trickier sections of the game without even breaking a sweat. But at the end of the fight, I do want you to notice, I beat the Haunter and my friendship disappears, and that's because Return is officially stronger than Headbutt. I think the decision just to get this out of the way and save some space is smart, but since this is the first time we're seeing the little huggy friendship graphic, I do want to show you guys exactly when it would go away, 176. Moving forward, I'm, I'm trying to get better at the flow of Gen 2 videos just videos in general. If you watch my really old Gen 1 videos, I would just explain trivial things, and I felt like I needed to talk about everything, every single thing in the run. But after doing a whole bunch of stuff and gaining all the experience from editing, I realized that I don't need to tell people exactly what I'm buying or go over every minuscule detail because all it does is kind of bloat and pad the video. For example, I think that seeing every single errand and goldenrod every single video, like grabbing the bike, getting the coin case, getting a haircut, picking up Abra, talking to the squirt bottle lady, I think it's really redundant. Whether you are a first time viewer or you are a veteran of the channel, those things just are not important in the long run 
And I think respecting everybody's time, but trimming out stuff like that. I think it's the difference of having like a 50 minute video full of bloat to having a 35 minute video that's really focused and gets to the point. I know you guys know what I'm talking about. Have you ever sat down and you've seen like a one hour and 30 minute video and it just got really boring by the time they even made it halfway through the game because they kept repeating stuff over and over? I don't want to be that person. But tangents aside, I am going to finish up the last little bit of errands here. I'm going to be zooming through the lighthouse getting a crabby getting strength getting those super repels to set myself up for the rest of the game and before you know it it's time for a swift swim down to cyanwood and i'm gonna say this is the spot where i should have already learned to return on the learn set and i did pretty much in every practice run but i forgot today the footage we're still gonna have headbutt and what that means is that we're gonna have to do Chuck, brother. without it like most runs, Primeape doesn't really matter. It doesn't resist surf, so I can just really just blast it down. It doesn't do much, but I do have the Mint Berry, so I equipped it for safety. And for some reason, when the Polyrath comes in, I decide just to go for Hypnosis, kind of beat it to the punch here. I do, I, it connects, but it just wakes up really quick. And what we see here is just a slow little trickle in of headbutts. I have the Mint Berry just in case it goes for something. And I just kind of slowly beat it down, and we end up getting this badge as well. No, no big problems here. After defeating Chuck, you do get access to Fly. This is one of the most important parts of the run, but just like the Goldenrod errands, for now it really just amounts to backtracking just a little bit. There's a couple of rare candies, there's a nugget. I personally like to go back to Azalea Town and pick up the charcoal because it sells for just as much as a nugget, but we don't really need to show all those things. What's really important for this run is going to pick up Mystic Water in Cherry Grove. The little boost to water damage is big because we've already seen Surf is really powerful and just making it that much more powerful is just really good. I didn't really know what to do with Mystic Water, so I just drew like a little water bottle. Almost like a little fantasy potion bottle. I don't know. What would you guys do with Mystic Water? Would you just use like the standard Pokemon Mystic Water Sprite, or would you make your own like I did? And when we're done with that, it's, it's time, guys. It's time for the best section of the game. It's time to go beat up a bunch of level 15 Coughings and Zubats. But through the magic of video editing, we don't even have to look at it. And I think that means we can just pretty much skip straight to Price. Now, Price here, his first two Pokemon are going to be Water and Ice type, which means it's going to resist Surf. So we have to use Return at this point. We have Return finally. And I think even if you got like 10 Icy Wind debuffs, it really doesn't matter. You just kind of chip away at it. And then your Prize is waiting in the back. He does have a Pilo Swine that's just conveniently weak to Surf. We can clean this thing up, get another gym, and we can just keep it rolling straight into Jasmine. And once again, I don't have to build up any suspense or anything like that. Stab Surf, that's all you need to know. The only reason I didn't do Jasmine before Price was just it was more convenient. I was already next to Price anyway. But it's a, it's a series of one shots, and I think you guys know what time it is. It's sad for me to announce that it's time for the Rocket Takeover section, the part of any run where everybody just dreads it. Is there anybody out there that gets to the Rocket Takeover section and they're like, yes! Finally, I get to fight level 20 Zubats for 20 minutes of my life. Let me know in the comments down below. Rocket takeout section, is it your favorite or is it not your favorite? When that's all over with, it is time to buy vitamins. Now, I normally don't touch on this too long. A lot of times I'll just skip it, but I did need Carbos today. And if you're like a really astute observer of the videos, you're gonna notice that the little vitamin markers on the side are not right. It's because the decision to move speed to the bottom corner, just like Gen 1 was late. And I didn't remember to move my modifiers and vitamins over. So those things are a little bit off. It doesn't really matter. But I did need like six carbos here. And I picked up a few extra calciums. Ultimately, I decided that ice beam was not worth it to get after the Elite Four. So that's why I'm pretty much spending all my money now, just to let you know. And that's just going to take us into the final Johto Gym. And we finally, for one of the only times in the video, you're going to see the pink bow on Politoed. So just really soak this up and enjoy it while it's here. But the first three Dragonairs, they're weak to Ice Punch. We can just sock them right in the mouth. They go down, no problem. And the only reason for the pink bow is to give me better ranges on the very neutral Kingdra. And you can see here it works out perfectly. I get the ranges. Pretty easy battle overall. And if you haven't noticed, outside of having to do a little extra training here and there early in the game, Politoed's actually really powerful right now. To prepare for the league, Polito does have to go pick up the two optional candies, something that Scizor did not have to do, and we'll kind of get into that 
as it comes up. But Politoed just, it doesn't have any boosting moves or anything like that. So I need all the extra levels I can get while keeping the actual battles of the game down. So we pick up World Islands and we pick up the Mount Mortar Candy. There are a couple of extra battles I'm gonna pick up here. The first one is Cool Trainer Megan, which is right when you're heading towards the league. You might think she's mandatory, but she's actually not a random spinner. She's just a regular spinner, so you can skip her pretty easily, but she gives pretty good experience. And then there's Psychic Richard. I take on him as well. The rest is really standard, and I'm actually not going to be picking up Earthquake. I think I've touched on this lots of times before, but Earthquake comes so late in this game that Return is just better. Unless you have a lot of problems coming up with Steel Tops, you just don't need it. And most of the time, your problems with Steel Tops are going to be from Jasmine and and it's already over. Now I'm gonna bring up the split data. Remember we were seven seconds separated at the third gym. Things went kind of up and down for a while, but after the Claire split, both Pokemon were still only 27 seconds apart, really close. Now the disparity starts to happen at the Elite Four start time. It's all the way up to six minutes now, and it's pretty much because Politoed had to do some backtracking, pick up the World Island and the Mount Mortar candies, and I had to do some extra battles as well. You guys also have to remember that Scizor picked up Swords Dance around this section, and this is where Scizor sort of starts to really take off because it can do pretty much anything at a low level just because, you know, having 130 attack and being able to double, triple your attack is just really powerful. But I don't think six minutes is the end of the world. I think it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. We'll take a look at this probably at the end of the Kanto section after we get done with blue, but let's leave it here for now. And I think we should just dive into the Elite Four. I did use candies to get up to level 54 to give me kind of a boost in the Elite Four as I tend to do, and that's pretty much all I could use to not compromise the red fight later, and this is gonna make the fight a demolition. Ice Punch, it's good against a large majority of Will's team, and I do have Return to kind of handle the rest, and what it all boils down to is that I don't have to waste anyone's time here. The first battle was pretty much over just like that. For Koga, the same concepts are gonna apply here. It was a fight that the extra candies did help with ranges. For example, hitting past level 53 for damage rounding did guarantee the one shot on Fortress, which isn't really a problem, but saving turns always feels good. It's a little bit faster. And then when you look at the end, making stall inclined Pokemon like Crobat down to a one shot, it also goes a long way, but don't blink already guys. It's already two down for the Toad. Bruno is up next, and to try to avoid being a broken record, the candies are just really helpful here as well. Now, I'm trying this part without candies or extra battles. It just lets the vast majority of his team hang on and start to do chip damage. Now, in this footage, the Hitmonchan does hang on and gets to throw out a Thunder Punch, but Hitmonchan has negative special, so it doesn't matter that much. And I'm healthy enough here that I don't have to worry. But if you did get chipped down and Machad gets off like a crit cross chop, you could reset here. And I did have that problem in practice. But Politoed is pretty clutch. It gets the crit. We don't even have to see it. It doesn't even matter if it did crit at this point. And when you take into account that Onyx is the last Pokemon, this is a done deal. And remember, some of these optimized runs, they might not look that difficult, but don't forget all of the thought that kind of went into making this as fast and consistent as possible. But that's three down. Next up is Karen, and this one comes down to one thing, early sand attacks. They're very annoying, we already know. Now Surf hits really hard, but Politoed, it will not be in the Umbreon one-shot club today, but I do get confused as like a parting gift going into the rest of the fight. With Surf and Ice Punch, the only way that I can lose here is if I hurt myself. If I start missing turns, I can start taking damage, that's pretty much the only way you can lose. And spoiler alert, I don't, and I clean up pretty well here, and I'm always pretty happy when I avoid those pesky little sand attacks, but let me kind of spend the rest of this battle talking about the nickname for this run. I generally set them before the run, we have a good time, we always try to do something funny, but Gamehook has been kind of on one lately. It's been a little bit weird, and it only changed the first letter of my nickname. So my name here is Folly Toad with an F instead of a P, and it doesn't mean anything at all. It just, it looks kind of dumb. So if you're kind of sitting here to this whole video wondering, hey, what does Folly Toad mean? Nothing. I wanted to name it Frog after the great Chrono Trigger character, but some of the duct tape kind of fell off game hook and it just didn't work. I really wanted to address that at some point in the video, but that's about it. Let's uh, take a look at the champion. I 
love giving the champion an intro, but I also don't want you guys to have high expectations for like an intense battle here. Outside of Gyarados, where I have to use neutral damage, everything else is going to melt like butter. I outspeed, I have Ice Punch for his 17 Dragonites, and then we have Surf at the end for the Fire Lizard and the Flying Fossil, and this one is it's over as quickly as it began. Just like Gamehook with the nicknames, the Defeat Champion flag was also kind of bugged here, so that's why the crown is already on. I promise that Politoed's not being cocky and just presuming that it's going to win. The game code was just really kind of funky for this run. There were some slight technical difficulties, but it's all right. And I knew that you guys kind of enjoyed the Generation 1 crown. I like it a lot too, and I really wanted to put it into my Gen 2 runs, but hopefully it's all good the next time we do it. But I do think it's a pretty great sign when you can do all of the entire Elite Four without really going into in-depth on the battles. And just like that, that's the Johto segment of the game over with. Politoed has been pretty dominant and the candies really did pay off to save a lot of time here, but let's keep it rolling, let's fade to black, let's breeze past the Kanto section. When we always take a look at Kanto, one truth always prevails. It's the fact that it's really easy. So today I'm just gonna be hopping off the boat and I'm immediately gonna go slap around Lieutenant Surge without a second thought because top matchups, they just don't matter at this point in the game and the footage is gonna show you that. So pay attention if you think otherwise. Kanto is all about being fast and efficient and it's my opinion that you should never tailor this part of the game around the Pokemon and its typing, but rather just go for pure speed, make it as fast as you can and the runs are just going to be better as a result. So with speed in mind, I just I blast through here and we don't have to waste any time. And the only things to really note is that I'm going to be picking up all the rare candies available. I'm going to be grabbing leftovers from the Celadon restaurant and I'll be picking up Psychic to have on the final learn set. And now let's just kind of hop into blue and just kind of tie a bow around this little section. Overall, this one doesn't need an intro. It doesn't really need a bunch of elaboration. And it's very, it's sort of similar to Lance. I have great coverage. I can do super effective damage to most things outside of like Alakazam and Gyarados. And this is a pretty easy first try victory, but it's not really clean. I take a lot of damage. You can see Alakazam, Gyarados, and even the Arcanine with the priority move extreme speed. They do some pretty heavy damage to me, but the outcome is inevitable. And in the blink of an eye, due to the power of video editing, that's gonna be all 16 badges down. Now let's take a final look at split data so we can see how this all looks in an easy to digest list. Remember that early we were only 7 seconds apart, and then that gap grew to 6 minutes at the start of the Elite Four. But at the end of the day, Swords Dance and Scizor's ability to make fights shorter with a single setup in most cases, it really started to stretch out the time. So as we stand here right now, there's about an 8.5 minute gap between the two Pokemon, and I think it's very clear that Scizor is not going to be beat in today's video. It's just a really good Pokemon. Now looking ahead to Red, I will use the remaining candies, including the one near Mount Silver's entrance to get us up to level 70 and let me kind of set up a couple of things one thing really the main thing you need to know is that Carbos along with at least level 69 is where you need to be to outspeed Pikachu and it's very important because going second and then getting hit with an immediate turn one thunder that just it doesn't scream success to me it doesn't set us up well but with that in mind I think we can talk about the rest of the details inside of the battle so let me strap that burger on to Politoed and let's just dive into this one and let's finalize the run. Like I said earlier, you have to be able to outspeed and one-shot the Pikachu. It's not really up for debate. You do have to use Surf here because Return is not reliable enough. And please don't ask about Earthquake. Pikachu is very frail and weak. It doesn't need you to have a dedicated move just to get past it. So Surf does just fine. Venusaur is next. And you can see that Politoed is kind of faced with this double whammy right from the start. But it's really not that bad at all. Psychic is a two-shot. And when you consider that Red will almost always set up Sunny Day immediately, since we're at full health, Help. It's free. It's not a threat at all. And you might be saying, hey, this looks easy. You got rid of the Pokemon that you have a top disadvantage against. But this is where the difficulty is going to spike up. So Venusaur sets up Sunny Day, meaning that the water damage is now halved. Espeon's going to come in. It loves setting up Reflect. That's going to stop Return from doing damage. And our only other move is Psychic, which is resisted. On top of that, Psychic from Espeon is just going to chunk you down. And even with the lower damage Polish Toad, it can still get through. We can still do this just fine. But you're going to see in this first fight here, I didn't think that Hypnosis was really needed here, but we are at half health, we do make it through, and we go into the biggest beefer in all the land. I 
hate Red Snorlax, and I'm going to go on record of saying that as a whole, you could probably defeat Red on average about five levels earlier if he didn't have this tanky monstrosity. The play here, it's Hypnosis. Now, if you miss it like we do here, and it gets an amnesia off, return is going to be the play. And remember that if it's asleep, it can still use Snore. So this isn't completely comfortable, especially when you consider Reflect is usually set up. And Amnesia is just going to make your special moves do zero damage. Now, I actually get a crit here, and it helps. And that makes it a little easier to kind of bide my time for the Reflect to wear off. And I've made it past here. And at this point, my mindset was that the run's over. I've done it. Blastoise and Charizard, they're the only two Pokemon left. And I do fail Hypnosis. And it was just a bad play overall on the Tanky Turtle. I shouldn't have went for Hypnosis here. But that's not really the story that I need to tell. Sometimes you kind of make mistakes in routing. And my mistakes here were pretty big. It was something I couldn't see. My data and my simulations, they told me that Charizard was a guaranteed one shot at level 70. So this part doesn't even matter. Even if you got pretty low on Blastoise, this one would still be over if you had the guaranteed one shot but here's the mistake in detail sometimes when you're simming damage or you're doing practice you just kind of overlook something and here I thought that I would tank a wing attack and then I would one shot with surf and the run would be over but I accidentally kept mystic water on in the sims and the reality is that Charizard is only around a 56% chance to one shot without it so here I'm obviously gonna miss the range I go down but this was like a pretty promising attempt I made it all the way to the end I was within one turn and you would think that I could just make some minor corrections and go back into it, but that's not what the game had in mind. So my adjustment here was to put the Espeon asleep, maybe save some health, but look at this. I start to miss my moves, it hits a Psychic, it gets the special defense drop, and it just solos me down. Uh, we immediately get a second reset, Espeon just took me out back and just beat me down. But what about this third attempt here? I blast through the Espeon, I take no damage. Now surely this is going to be the attempt, because this was perfect, but once again the answer is no, and it's due to me just missing moves. Hypnosis, when it's not doing well, feels incredibly bad to play with. With. and we're gonna see Snorlax get the paralysis I'm gonna go down and this is starting to get kind of frustrating this is the point to where you start to think Maybe I didn't route this right. Maybe I should go back to the drawing board. Maybe I need to do a whole other run. And I generally, I try to keep my cool here, but on the following attempt, I decide that I'm just going to blast Espeon down because it worked a lot in practice. But we've already seen a couple of times Espeon does a lot of damage. And by the time I realize that I've started to mess up here and I finally get that sleep to connect, I'm already in the red health. This one's pretty much over. And I'm kind of like frantically trying to stall out the battle to restore some health with leftovers. And once again, Espeon solos me again, and that's going to be a fourth reset. And I hate this, guys. I hate it because I was so close to just full sweeping the first time, getting through with that zero reset run just, just a few minutes ago. So it is what it is. So let's just kind of hop into that winning attempt. And it's pretty clear how things need to go by this point. Now jumping over to the Espeon once again, because the first two are 100% consistent. And all I can say is that Hypnosis, it just connects on Espeon and Snorlax. There's not really anything that I changed up here. I just didn't miss a couple of times. And that's all it takes. I'm even able to get past the Espeon on at full health and then I hit the first turn sleep on Snorlax and that allows me to be able to use Surf on it. You don't get to see that very often just because of how often it uses Amnesia turn one. And when you kind of flash forward and you see the end of this fight, I'm even going to get the one shot range on the Charizard. So needless to say that this fight goes absolutely perfect. And as it kind of plays out to completion, let me just kind of cover my bases here and say that I did try out detect strats over hypnosis. I thought maybe I could stall out the fight. I was doing like a working strategy where I would just tank the thunder from Pikachu and I would just kind of use detect every other turn on the solar beam. And it was all right. I just didn't have enough damage for Snorlax or even Charizard. So I went up an extra level and went back with hypnosis. I think that was the right call. And I think that the fact that I was almost able to first try this is kind of a testament to that. But this one's over. It's in the books. Politoed finishes the run with a 3 hour, 52 minute and 5 second time. It was almost a perfect run, but it got a little bit sloppy in the end. We had the 4 resets, but that's kind of the nature of hypnosis. And I firmly believe that taking the risk with those resets, it would still be faster than the alternative of maybe grinding up an extra 3 or 5 levels. Once again, we are retooling Pokemon Crystal right now. This is the third produced video. We did Scizor, we did Fortress. So Scissor still has the lead here. Now I plan on doing more Crystal runs runs more frequently to kind of get caught back up and I'm going to be redoing some runs on stream so that we can get enough data points to finally get some tier cards up getting these Pokemon ranked but it's not ready yet but I am really curious about how Politoed would rank on a 0 to 100 scale it felt really solid to play for the most part and it kind of feels weird to not know what this Pokemon is ranked like is it an A tier run or is it a B tier run but 
I don't know. We'll find out soon. I digress. Special shout out to my channel members and Patreons. The support means a lot, and without it, I honestly think I probably would have given up on this hobby a while ago. It does keep me motivated to know that there's a little core audience that likes this stuff, and it just keeps me motivated. And if you made it this far in the video, you're a real one, and just know how much I appreciate you giving me the time out of your days to watch my video. I think we're going to go back to like a cross-gen run next week, but I think I might immediately hop back into Crystal after that, but who knows? It's not set in stone yet, but what I do know is that that's about all I have for you guys, and I'll catch you on the next one. Bye!